This is Solo Travel Talk. Your solo travel advisor is Astrid Clements. Astrid is thinking about 2019, and on this episode of Solo Travel Talk, we get to hear about where she is dreaming of visiting next year. If you need some travel inspo, if you want to think about ultimate solo travel trips, this is the episode for you. I'm producer Catherine O'Brien. Your solo travel advisor, Astrid Clements, is going to profile four trips. Trips she actually plans on taking. Assessing why they have made the cut, what Astrid is looking forward to, and even the solo factor. Here's Astrid. Okay, now to the point. Let me go back over the outline of the key points she wants to make for these four that made (laughs) my three dream trips for 2019. Of course, the place, why it made it onto my list, what's the solo travel factor, how solo friendly is it, how challenging it will be, and what do I expect, basically how I would deal with the challenges etc. And when do I think I'll go? Okay. So the number one trip, can you guess what it's going to (laughs) be? Come on, Catherine. Well, I want to say India, but I- Hey, you're half there. (laughs) I have decided that I want to take, and I've looked at this several times, but I'm going to finally do it, is a luxury train trip on the palace on wheels through Royal Rajasthan. Now, this doesn't take me through all of India. It's just a certain area of northern India. It doesn't get me to the Himalayas, doesn't get me down to Goa, doesn't get me to Mumbai, but it gives me the royal period of when the British were in India and that whole a Rajasthani period with the Maharajas and the Viceroys and the Elephant Polo and all of that. So I have really said this is the way I need to do it because first and foremost, you're on a train and this is a special luxury train. It's not one of their regular routes or commuters and it's owned by the government. So it's prized. So I know The security concerns around it, I definitely have faith they have it all taken care of. But you're on this train. It's eight days, seven nights. It goes from Delhi back to Delhi. Some of the stops are Jaipur, which is the famous pink city. All the buildings are pink. And you go to the famous Amber Fort that's so gorgeous. And I think it's the Four Wind Palace. And the market there. So you go to basically the magnificent pink city. Then the next stop you go to Rathambore National Park. And you actually do a safari ride. Because in this particular game area are the magnificent Bengal tigers. So you go tiger watching. And there are other animals that you see too that are in this type of nature. But I thought that that would be kind of a nice break. On this particular short trip, they give you little snippets of various aspects of India. So I get a little bit of a safari like with wild animals there. Then to Yudapur, and this is the beautiful town where you have the gorgeous lake and there's a fabulous lake palace that was very royal, temples, some other palaces. So you go out in this luxurious cruise to this lake palace, and you have lunch and everything. So this tour is all about how the Maharajas lived and the royal Indians live and how they meshed with the British royals and all that kind of stuff in the development of making India magnificent, okay? So that's what they try to show you, all of the little sides and aspects of what it was like at that time. And then the next stop is, I've never heard of this place, is Jay's Salmer. But this is an area where you go to a couple of private mansions, a market, and then it's actually 
desert-like. So you do a camel ride, and then at night you have a big evening under the stars with you're sitting on Indian carpets, handmade carpets, and they cook the meal outside. You have Indian music and the whole thing, kind of similar to what was done when I went on that wild ride in the <laughs> Toyota Land Cruisers in Dubai and that beautiful Arabian night, which was quite beautiful. Mm-hmm. And they had like the camel ride at first and then the whole thing. Even though it was touristy, it was really nice. I think this is the Indian version of it, but with the Indian culture. So I'm sure it's going to be nice. And then the last stop before you go back to Delhi, of course, is Agra and the Taj Mahal. Now, this is not a long trip to India. I might even decide to tack on five days in Mumbai and hire a private guide when I get to Mumbai or before I'm there to do some of the things that I want to do there, okay? But the train is like five-star. It's beautiful, and actually the carriages are done like the Maharaja's carriage would have been. They tried to do all these little carriages very beautifully appointed with carved wood and everything and beautiful fabrics. So I've seen all the videos and everything, and it does look, it does look very nice. Now, you never know how nice it is till you actually get in the train, but it looks pretty nice. And you have two meal cars that are both very nice. You have a separate bar, lounge car. You even have a spa car on it. So it's pretty okay. You don't have to pack and unpack. You unpack one time. They take care of all the land excursions. That's all part of the price and all the meals. So really, all you do is just pay, fly to Delhi, get to the train station. (laughs) Well, I think they do meet you at the airport and get you to the train station. And I've thought about it several times. I thought, is this really for an introduction to India? I think this is a very safe and luxurious way for a solo travel to experience some of India. They have similar trains that go south. The Deccan Express and the Golden Chariot have different routes. So... I don't know if I want to spend that much money to go both north and south, but it's on my list to definitely go in 2019. And another good thing, you know, you asked me about the solo friendly features and what are the difficulties. Well, here, everything is taken care of. India is so huge, and getting from point A to point B is difficult. And it is dangerous. So this solves all of that for the solo traveler. And then you do meet people. You're going to meet people, obviously, on this train. I mean, you're all going to be together for seven or eight days. And for some solo travelers, I would say at least half, when they travel, they do want to really meet new people, have great memories, maybe even strike up a lasting friendship. So they're not totally solo all the time. I mean, you can go on pure solo trips. You're not going to be totally solo because you're going to end up talking to somebody or some whatever. But when you go with a specific group, and especially if you're a solo traveler, usually the people that are conducting the tour or whatever, they take special care to make sure that you're having a good time or you're interrelating as much as you want to. If they see you don't want to, they're not going to bother you. So I think that that's really a plus, as well as you don't have to worry about any of the daily issues. You know, when you travel solo and it's you and you have to navigate through a lot of things, like decide where you want to go eat for lunch. You might have your whole list of restaurants and you might have had kind of your itineraries, what you're going to do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. But then things kind of get messed up because it rains or this is closed when they said it was going to be open and that messes you up. You couldn't eat there and then you're trying to figure out. So you have to kind of readjust all the time. And let me tell you, you have to be willing to do that. But if you're used to it and you get used to doing it and it doesn't bother you, then that's just part of your experience. 
But when you're on one of these, uh, you don't have to do that. And especially, I would think in India, you would just miss a lot because you just say, I just can't cope with that. I'll just hang out in my hotel. <laughs> and I don't really like traveling on tours. I really don't. I don't mind day tours and towns where I am, but I don't like to be herded around from one city to other in a bus and that kind of thing. I just really don't like that. But India is such a difficult destination. I think this train is actually better than doing it any other way because you would have to get on flights and then fly into here, then get on a bus with everybody and then go to the hotel and unpack again and then stay there for two days and then pack again and get back in the bus and get to the airport, fly again. You're losing all these hours with getting to the airport, waiting, getting all the back. Oh, God. This train thing, I think, is very, very interesting. The only negative is the single supplement. And with this, they do not waive it. Mm -hmm. So if you're traveling with somebody else and sharing a room, you know, your husband, significant other, or you, the base fare is anywhere from 45, 50, 4,550 to 6,050. 55. So for eight days, seven nights, it's not super pricey, but it's getting up there. But if you're single, they tack on at least another $3,000. Oh, oh, yes. At minimum, it's going to be around 7500 So that's over $1,000 a day. Could be as much as 9000 for eight days. And that's getting really pricey in terms of just a tour. But there are lots that go into it, the train, the safety, the logistics. But it seems to me there's a lot of profit in there too. So especially you're paying for a phantom guest. If you're paying $3,000, that is the cost of what that particular person would foot in some profit, not quite as much profit because they don't expect to make this off of blah, blah, blah. So I don't ever like that. That's one of the reasons why I travel solo and I don't do those tours because they do that to you every time. It's terrible. So date when I plan to visit. February, late February 2019. So when it's still cool and it's not in the rainy season. So I would say probably by the beginning of October, I will have booked this trip. Okay. So that's the first one. Oh, wait, you got to take the recorder with you so you can do a live from the train episode. Oh, Lord, I'll probably go. Can you believe it? <laughs> I can't believe it. Hi, Ben. New Delhi. Yay, they let me in. <laughs> I'm here. Okay, the second trip. Can you guess where I want to go for the second one? Japan. That article convinced you. Japan. The land of the rising sun. Now, I mean, I really have wanted to go to China for maybe the last 10 years, and especially when I went to China seven years ago. Actually, I went solo to China for five weeks, and I mean, I went all over China except Tibet, and I didn't get to go into Mongolia and a few other areas, but I really covered a lot of ground. And I loved the Oriental aesthetics. I thought the history and the culture of variations, I could see how it was different, the North and the South. I really, really liked China. I liked looking at the people. I mean, always before I went to China, I thought the Chinese all look the same. The Chinese, the South Koreans, the Vietnamese, and they would always say, no, they don't really look the same. But to me, I didn't have enough familiarity with the differences and hadn't been there. So when I went to China for five weeks and I really saw a lot of different Chinese, you can really see the differences. And there's so many Chinese that are strikingly, exquisitely beautiful. They have the most beautiful black hair in the world. And their skin is so beautiful. It never ages. And just some of their features, and you think, boy, that's the most beautiful person I've ever seen in the world. So I liked learning and seeing 
this race in mass and these differences in the way they look. And really, the fabulous, what I consider non-filling food, that Chinese food, you can eat and eat and eat and you never feel full. And you don't really gain any weight. I don't know what it is over there. I think it's because they drink so much tea and there's something in that tea that helps negate the calories. Because there's no overweight people in China. And they work a lot. But they eat a lot, too. When they eat, oh, boy, they get down on it. They don't want to talk, nothing. Choo, they eat like, whoo, 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 sucking it all in as fast as they can. But the food, I really like the food. So Japan, I'd always heard that they were the most refined out of the East Asian cultures and countries. I mean, they're kind of snobby to the Chinese. They just think that they're the superior of all that area of the world. So when I was reading this article, and it took me back to a lot of the stuff that I've read about Japan before with the stunning landscapes, the beautiful historic buildings and the castles, that those shapes of those roofs. You see it all over China, but those are more aggressive. The Japanese is much more feminine elegance flow to it. And beautiful and how they always put it in lakes and different settings. Everything is thought about from A to Z with the Japanese in their kind of style consciousness. It's something that you just sit there and study because it's very well thought out before they even begin to construct it. And I love that. I'm married to an architect, so... I loved it before, and now that I'm married to him and all these 40 years, and he's educated me even more, so I'm really in tune to it. I mean, I look at every door. I get all carried away. In it. But there's a lot of times there's like a musical theme to it, or there's a lot of thought behind a lot of buildings that a lot of people don't realize, and it's a shame. Everybody should have a little architectural history so they have more appreciation for structures in spaces, because it's important to your quality of life. But they went into all the Japanese gardens, the beautiful green gardens and the rock gardens, and how all that ties into you and how you relate to it. Oh, man, it just went on and on. I thought, oh, yeah, I need to experience this. Then the whole geisha culture, the tea houses, Hiroshima, the horrible Hiroshima, modern Tokyo, and then historical Kyoto. They touched on all of this. So I was trying to find how I really wanted to tackle this. Because like India, even though it's not big, all these things are spread out. There's a concentration of modern life in Tokyo. And if that's all you want, go there. And you'll see a lot of neon lights, and it's modern, and you'll get the best Japanese food. There's some really fine things to do there. But it's a modern Japanese experience. You go to Kyoto, you got to take the bullet train there. It's more going back in time. There's certain areas where you've got the geishas. And it's more like New Orleans versus New York City, kind of like that. That's what I got. But you got a lot of other areas in Japan. So here again, there's a lot of logistics that are involved. So I thought, how am I, as a solo traveler, going to do this in a reasonable length of time, not too long? Because Japan, unfortunately, is very expensive. So when I travel solo, I do s- travel slower in everything I do. I don't do as many things in one day is maybe as you would do if you were with another person or a group or in a bigger group because you're doing all the planning, all the logistics, everything. And I don't push myself. I always like to have some kind of flow. And if I'm doing something myself, I don't want to get myself so stressed out that I end up twisting my ankle or doing something stupid because I've overextended myself. So what I do, because I know myself, is I just stay there longer. I do everything I want to do, but I might have to tack on three or four days. And at $400 a night in a nice hotel, 
that's money that if you could do the trip efficiently, that you wouldn't have to waste that money and it would be easier on you. And that's been one of the reasons why I haven't been there either, because I felt like, oh, my God, I'm going to blow through $12,000 in a New York second. And then I'm going to do other things. And it's going to be $20,000 for me to really do Japan right, because I just know myself. So I started looking and I came across what I thought was an excellent tour of Japan. Now, I do not like to take tours. This was offered by Cox and Kings, which is a great travel company that offers tours. They're like Abercrombie and Kent, but they might even be more discriminating. But they have a tour called Japan's Cultural Treasures. And it's either offered periodically for groups, or they will actually have it tailor made for just you. That trip, they will get all of your logistics, your individual guides, and everything to make the whole thing happen. The cost is just a little bit more, but they will do that, which tells you what kind of company they are to begin with, okay? But I think this is a very smart way to do Japan, an introduction, because I want to see what it's all about the first time, get a good experience. If I really like it, we'll come back and stay a week in Tokyo or a week somewhere else where I can either even get into it deeper, okay? So on this trip, this is what the itinerary is. It goes from Tokyo to Tokyo, and a lot of it is with the bullet train, okay? The worst thing about this is the packing and the unpacking. But that's just part of it. So you go into it knowing you're going to do that. You travel light or you plan for that. You'll visit Mount Fuji, Kenazawa Gardens and Castles. You'll go to Kyoto, the tea houses, the Geisha District. Then you'll travel on to Ninjo Castle, which is the Shogun's Imperial Palace. Ro. Anji, all I can think is the ninjas when I'm saying this, temple, Kinkakuji Temple and Gardens. You'll also go to the ancient city of Nara, which it was flourishing in 710 AD. Now, this is an old, old Japanese village. Remember, Japan was an island, okay? Well, it might not have been then, but I think it was. I mean, the whole world, I thought, I think the landmass was connected at one time, but it was an island for all I know. Tadalji Temple is the largest wooden temple in the world. You see that. Then Hiroshima. You go to the Hiroshima Castle, the A-Bomb Museum, and the Peace Memorial. And then last, on your way back to Tokyo, you go to the Miyamajima. Island, and that's where that beautiful red Tory Gate is in the lake. You go out to the lake and you get to take pictures and everything. So, I think this is a relatively deep dive into this refined culture with a good, diverse itinerary. I wish it was a little bit longer, a little bit slower, and a little bit more, but these people know what they're doing. And so it's basically, I think, a very good quality first experience of Japan. I know they use the best guides. A lot of their guides are either retired professors or experts on history and culture. They don't just have somebody that they train to say these words. The quality of the people that you're around that are due or part of the tour are quite good. This trip will be challenging for the solo traveler. Like I said, the packing and unpacking can't be avoided. And I actually looked at the alternative of taking a cruise around Japan. And there's some cruises that go all around. But when I really thought about it, I thought the Cox and Kings offered the best itinerary 
for the full Japanese experience. I've just felt like the cruises would be a little bit more, I don't want to say canned, but not quite what I like to do. Not nerdish enough. I'm not sure. <laughs> but when I really thought about it, I said, mm, I think I would rather do that. Okay. And I don't really like cruising. I'm not against them. I think they're great for a lot of solo travelers because they solve a lot of issues. But I'm not so big a fan of them, but I would not say I would never go on one. Okay, so in general, for solo travelers, I do think the Cox and King, they really specialize in the making the solo travel experience comfortable, interesting, and exciting. They've done a great job in creating this trip, and I plan to go there late spring, which is basically middle May of next year. Wow. Yeah. So that'll be the spring. See, winter in India, spring in Japan. (laughs) Okay, now, I know you can't guess number three, but try. Well, okay, you can't go to Australia and (laughs) Japan in the same year. That can't be, right? Wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's either Antarctica or the South Pacific. And I looked at everything. Can you imagine how long this took me to really think about it? I I mean, just listening to it, you can feel it in the vibe. I mean, I gave this lots of just real thought. Well, the way I've decided that the best way for me, knowing myself, to tackle the South Pacific, because I don't not only want to go to... Australia. But I want to go to New Zealand too. And I want to go to Polynesia. I want to go to like that Bally High field. Because when you're over in that part of the world, you don't want to just go to Australia and go home. Then you got to do that horrendous flight again back to New Zealand. Oh my God, you probably spending. $25,000 on flights because you got to fly business class. I mean, you cannot go that far, but that's a long way. And I mean, I'm not really claustrophobic, but I have to get up and go. For me to stay in those metal tubes and that air pressure going down and everything, and oh my God, I mean, I'm stir crazy. I just don't like that. So this is how I'm going to tackle it. First of all, I'm going to do something I don't like to do. I'm going to go on a cruise. (laughs) You have said you don't like tours. You've got listed two tours. You don't like cruises. You're now going on a cruise. But you see why Listeners. I have to do these part of the area because they're not easy to okay. do as a solo traveler. And I've thought about every kind of thing because you got to think about budgets. You got to think about what you really like to do. You got to think about all kinds of things. So this is the most cost efficient as well as safety, as well as getting you to all these places you want to go, taking a lot of the negatives away from going. Okay? Okay. So, here we go. Princess Cruise Lines offers a 26-day cruise from San Francisco to Sydney. Now, I like this because... First of all, I only have to take one of those long flights, and I can leave from the United States. It has 16 days of just cruising. You don't go anywhere. So it gives you a lot of time to think, relax, read, get a spa, swim in the pool, go to the movie, whatever you want to do or nothing. So here you get your downtime. Your real downtime. And to some people, they don't like it. But to me, this is much more pleasurable than those two horrible long flights. So what I'm trying to say is I am doing a lot of different things on this way of tackling this area of the world. I'm getting my me time and being able to do things that I want to do, like read five books and five days or whatever, because I I can just sit on the deck and just read like a maniac. And I love to do that. 
and I get to do this on this ship, and that appeals to me. And I've always wanted to do the Queen Elizabeth and the Cunard line to go from New York to Southampton. That seven-day transatlantic where it's really upscale, it get dressed up at night to eat and everything, and it's a bygone era. And I like to do those kinds of things. Sometimes I want to be totally lean and mean. I just want a couple of things to wear, and I have a whole other agenda. But I like that other stuff, too. So this is a little bit of that, okay? Plus the stops. You take off from San Francisco. Then you go to Hilo, Hawaii, and Honolulu. You go to Bora Bora. You go to Papiti, French Polynesia. Pongo Pongo, America, Samosa. Then three places in New Zealand, Auckland, Taranga, and Napier, and then you end in Sydney. And what I want to do is add on a last side trip to Melbourne for like four days, because Melbourne is different than Sydney. But some of the activities on these excursions, which that was another thing that kind of made me think, yeah, I think this is the way I want to approach this. San Francisco, I mean, I've been there lots of times. But I've not done a lot in the Napa Valley. They have a great day wine thing or two days, or I I can't remember it exactly, through the Sonoma and Napa Wine Valley. That's perfect. That's what all I want at that point in time. Then when you get to Hilo, Hawaii, you go to the gorgeous Hawaii Tropical Gardens and the Penawaii Rainforest and Gardens really tropical, lush, lush that we don't get to see unless you go to some place like that in the world. Honolulu, you've got the Polynesian Cultural Center. So you kind of begin to get a real introduction into Polynesia because Hawaii really is Polynesian. Then also you go to the Ilani Palace, the King Kalukawa, who was known as the Merry Monarch, his palace. Queen Emma's Southern Palace, which basically you get a real feel for the lifestyle of the Hawaiian monarchy. For some people, they don't want to do this. There's all kind of adventure things. These are just things that I want to do. So if you don't like this kind of stuff and you think that that is completely ridiculous to you, there are a whole lot of other things that you can choose to do. Then in Bora Bora, you get a whole circle tour of that. And then you can go snorkeling, scuba diving, and everything. You get the Bora Bora beautiful water experience. Then Papati Tahiti. I will go to the Museum of Tahiti. And then they have this island tour where you go in a four-wheel drive. So you go all right, driving up and down and the mountains and on the beaches and the whole thing. Then Pago Pago. In fact, I forgot that that was even a place till I read that. America and Samoa, but you go to a village in the Samoan home tour, and you go to a villager's home. I think you have tea with them or you eat with them, but you really get a feel for the Samoan villages, and I love to do things like that. I'm always fascinated how these people live so simply, and they live to be 90 years old. How did they do that with limited running water and they still have to start a fire the real old way and all kinds of stuff. I just admire these people so much. They're in the rhythm and the mindset that seems to be much more closer really to nature and God in a certain way. I don't know how to describe it, but I like to be around it. There's a museum called the Taizi and Hayden Museum, but it's basically about Samoan culture which I know nothing about. But I think it will be interesting to get a little introduction into it and see how it's different from Tahiti and Bora Bora. I mean, they're all close, but they're not the same. And then you head to New Zealand. Auckland, more countryside wineries. By the end of this tour, I'm going to be a wino because there's so much wine in Australia and New Zealand. (laughs) It's ridiculous. But they have some very good excursions to do that. And I love all that. Because a lot of times when you do the wine tasting, you get little small plate meals and 
You do learn, and I must say I enjoy wine. I don't drink a whole lot, but I like it because food and palate is something I really enjoy. Then off to Taranga, and you go to the Tamaki Maori village with the Maori, the whole culture. So you get the heritage and the cultural legacy of the Maori people. And they do the singing, the dancing, traditional food. I mean, I'm sure it's going to be kind of touristy. But still, you see all that with them painted up and the dancing and all that kind of stuff. So I look forward to do that. And that's in New Zealand. Then Napier, New Zealand. This is a very interesting place because it has a lot of Art Deco architecture. So there's a whole city tour on Art Deco architecture. Now, I like Art Deco. And I've done Art Deco tours in Miami and New York City. But to have it in Napier, New Zealand, now that intrigues me how that caught fire there. That's really interesting to me. And then more several wine tasting <laughs> tours. Oh, you are kidding. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm not kidding. And I mean, it goes into to Sydney and Melbourne. There's wine tours everywhere. Of course, the Opera House City Tour. And I probably would stay a couple of days there to just get lost in city and do some different things. Yeah, I would probably plan on flying to Melbourne because if you go that far, you have to go to Melbourne because Melbourne is totally different than Sydney. But some of the things there would be the National Gallery of Victoria, which is the oldest art gallery in Australia. Everybody recommends the City Circle Tram Tour to take the tram around the city. Then the Block Arcade, there's like 25 boutiques, galleries, food emporium. It's a cool place to be, put it that way. The Melbourne Museum, which is the top cultural museum in Melbourne. And the Royal Botanical Gardens. I love botanical gardens. I love all the gardens. If they have a wonderful garden, whether it's a desert garden or botanical garden or a Japanese garden, I like to go to gardens. I have a black thumb. I kill everything. I can't grow anything, but I love it. I love flowers. I love the green. I just like being in gardens. So that's kind of what I was thinking about in Melbourne. So I'll round this out. Even though I'm not a big cruise fan, to say the least, I really think this is a very affordable way to tackle this area of the world. First of all, you only have that long flight, like I said, one time. You have a lot of interesting stops on an extensive itinerary. you got Polynesia, you have New Zealand, and you have Australia. Then the Golden Princess, it's actually a really good ship. It might be a little bit too big for my liking. But it has lots to do on it. And you have 16 days. So if you don't feel like reading that whole 16 days, there are other things that you can do. And so I like that. Plus, this whole thing is a combination of slow travel, relaxing. You're not doing a whole bunch. All those days out at sea, you're really relaxing. Then you go into one port and you do something all day and then some more days at sea. So I haven't done one of these kind of things in a long time. I've done them for like a week, kind of a little bit, but not 26 days. I mean, that's basically a month. Plus, you're going to meet other travelers when you're there. And you're probably going to meet some people you like, like I've said over and over. You're going to have some time. You have all the time alone you want. (laughs) And really minimal packing and unpacking. Really, not any at all except I want to go to Melbourne in that. So it's very little, which is, oh, God, that is so wonderful. So you don't have to be going to the airports, getting in the buses. And everything really is taking care of you, for you, except for the post-trip activity. So I really do think it's a super way for me to check my last two continents off that travel bucket list. So I plan to do that in early fall, basically at the end of September. So that's pretty good. That's really good. Okay. Then, number four, the last one, Catherine. Do you have any idea what this one is? (laughs) You got to step up your clairvoyant. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Okay, Well, 
Are we going to see you at McMurdo Station in Antarctica? Is this going to actually happen? No. Okay. What was the theme of the first mood theme that I talked about? Can you oh, remember spiritual that? sacred yeah. places. Okay. Return to Egypt? I don't know. You're close. Got to, yes. A Holy Land tour. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Yes. I really thought about it so many ways. What I wanted to do in this way. This is another place that I've wanted to go to. But I really wasn't that interested in specifically going all in through the evolution of Christianity. I guess I've kind of been more interested in Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, all these other isms that I didn't have any real background in. I'm a Christian, so I get all that. So it's kind of like that's not fascinating to you (laughs) or whatever. I do feel like, especially I'm older now, that I want to touch back into all of that and fine tune some things. And I think by going to where so much of this happened so long ago and changed the world, I think there's something for me there. It's calling me. That's what I can tell you. And two, you mentioned Egypt. The cork was popped off the bottle when I went to Egypt. That just blew me away so much. I was just kind of almost, ooh. So um, when I was looking at how I was going to do this, did I want to do it purely solo? Because I could see myself going from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and then maybe taking a tour out of Jerusalem, a couple of tours or whatever. But I thought, how do I really want to do this? And so here I go again. I don't like tours, but this one really did make me quit being so purist, like I could do it all. I can't do all of this, what I'm getting ready to tell you. That would be so costly and difficult to range, but I could pay. If I want to really pay, I could get it done, okay? Well. This particular Holy Land tour goes from Cairo to Tel Aviv. It's super. It starts before Christianity. Basically, the Egyptian era and takes the Egyptian philosophy and how it was evolved or there was an overlapping in Christianity was an offshoot of it. It kind of, a little bit, and this is very simple, and it's not totally correct. It's almost like the same basic philosophies with different names of characters and places. Not totally, but there's some of that. And I saw that somewhat in other religions. So the way this tour is laid out and how it evolves, I really like. Okay, so you start out in Cairo. You visit the pyramids, and I can't see those enough. I mean, I could go to those 10 times. I'd be happy every time I went. There's something about that whole place I just go, it makes me speechless. The Egyptian Museum. I went to the old one. They just opened a brand new one, I think the beginning of this year, the end of last year, and it is supposed to be fabulous. And many more of the objects that they have are able to be shown in this new museum. It's a lot larger than the original Egypt mu- Egyptian museum. You get a tour of old Cairo, which I didn't actually get to do old Cairo when I went on my Nile cruise. The Coptic church, which that was the first Christian church around, okay, in 4th century. Then you have the church of St. Sirgis, and I don't know all my Bible stuff, so... If I misspeak something, just humor me. I'm going to learn it when I go. (laughs) Then also you go to the oldest synagogue in Egypt, Synagogue of Ben Ezra. You go to the famous Khan El Khaldi Bazaar. I mean, this is a famous bazaar. And then you also get a little Nile cruise in that area. So that's a very nice time in Cairo. And to start, this Holy Land tour. So 
Next, you go to the Red Sea, and you go basically the route of the biblical exodus. You get to go and climb up Mount Sinai and basically trace the footsteps of Moses. After that, you head to Taba. I have no idea where this is. And it's basically the border crossing through Israel to Jordan. So your next real stop is Petra, and you go to the royal tomb, you see the obelisk, and then the beautiful church that is carved into that mountain. And then you stay in Amman, and I think there's a city tour in Amman. It's, Amman is really kind of like just a second stop. I don't remember a whole lot in there that's in part of the spiritual part of this. Then you head to Tel Aviv, and you stay in a wonderful hotel right there on the Mediterranean, and you've got, I think, a day to do the promenade, the art galleries, the cafes, and they've got a lot of music and everything along there. Then you head to Jaffa, which Jaffa is the oldest port in the world, and you visit St. Peter's Church in Jaffa, and, and next you go to Cesario Maritime, which is an early Christian center, and you also visit a Roman theater. You head next to Mount Carmel and then to, I think it's Megiddo, but it's the site of Armageddon. Then it's on to Nazareth, and you go to the Basilica Annunciation. This is where Jesus was, his birth was announced. Cana of Galilee, where Jesus did his first miracle. He turned water into wine. And on this trip, you have got a religious guide that is giving you so much commentary and tying it into the events of the day and the Bible and the evolution of Christianity as a religion that you will tie all of this to place. Then it's off to Tiberias in the Sea of Galilee and Magdala, which was the home of Mary Magdalene, you visit. The old synagogue, an old synagogue that was like the same time of Jesus. Now, that's an old synagogue. And you get on a boat ride in the Sea of Galilee, and this is where Jesus calmed the storm, and he walked on water. Next stop will be the Golan Heights, which you visit the Mount of Beatitudes, the Dead Sea, and Masada. Then it's off to Jerusalem, the one that has the most activities. You visit the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Western Wall, the Temple of the Mount, Via Della Rosa, and you can actually walk the Stations of the Cross, as well as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Jewish quarter in King David's tomb. It's wonderful. I mean, if I would go to Israel by myself and not do this, I'd probably do Dead Sea, all this in Jerusalem, and maybe head off to Tel Aviv and do the promenade in Bethlehem. I wouldn't get the whole evolution of it. It would cost me more to do it myself because I'd have to coordinate with special people to drive me here or this. So I think this is a very wonderful way to do it. And then the actual last stop before you go back to Tel Aviv is to Bethlehem, where you go to the Church of Nativity and the Garden Tomb, which is basically the site of Christ's resurrection. So it's a very nice way to end it. The solo-friendly quality, or is this solo-friendly? A big fat definitely. I mean, it really is, because it's everything organized and taken care of from the food, the lodging, the logistics. And this is way too challenging otherwise. That's why when I went to Egypt, I took a cruise, which was part of Uniworld and basically a tour, because there was no way for me to uh, realistically tackle all of the magnificent things down the aisle in Egypt. It was impossible. I forgot how much I paid for it. But if I would have tried to do it myself, oh, my God, it would have been $40,000. I mean, to really do it and be safe and the whole thing, it would end up oh, way over the top. And then the hotel 
accommodation. I looked at every one of them. They're very good. I wouldn't call them ultra luxury, but it's that part of the world, and they're quite fine. There's some Marriott's and Sheraton's, and there's a couple that are not part of a chain, but I didn't find anything that was off-putting to me, and I'm kind of picky. Expert religious guides, which that's really the key to really making this trip come alive and exciting. I mean, to do a deep dive into the evolution of early Christianity, I personally need that. I just will share that with you because I've learned everything in catechism and then after that in Bible studies and I have such wonderful friends and a lot of them do things like that and they always share with me everything and I get it, okay? But I don't have enough real understanding and grounding in the evolution of the early part. Because I keep thinking, well, were they just making that up? Or did this get lost in translation? Or has it changed through the years? But if I go myself to the place where it happened and listen to all of this, I can make my own conclusions and have peace with it. (laughs) And I feel like it will be something that I really will cherish my faith even more. Because it has been the reason why I've had a beautiful life. Even though I don't go to church every week and all that, it has. Because, I mean, I hold on to all of those tenets that I learned very firmly. And I try to never break a Ten Commandment. I get real basic about things, but I think with the final analysis, good morals are everything. And that's totally in what you learn. And then to do that and then to live by faith and to pray, it's been the whole foundation of my life. Otherwise, it would have been one disaster after the other. (laughs) So, okay, you'll meet fellow travelers. And in this particular kind of tour, I would think it would be very like-minded people, kind of like birds of a feather flocking together. They're not going on this tour just to go on a vacation. They're going on this tour to think about what they really believe and to learn more and to expand their spiritual life. I think that's good to be around people like that when you're going on the same kind of experience. Okay, I must say I'm super excited about this trip, and I really do think this is uh, a itinerary that's pretty over the top. I went through a lot of them. This was the best one that I saw, the only negative. Lots of packing and unpacking. This one, I'm a really travel light. I'm not going to really worry about what I look like. (laughs) One black dress. Yeah. (laughs) And I plan to do this one during the Christmas season. Oh, neat. Isn't that cool? I thought that made it even better. Well, Catherine, that's the broadcast for today. And I know I might have worn out some of my listeners, and probably you, with the (laughs) length of this podcast. But all of the travel dream trips that I've discussed, I feel like are exciting and enriching solo travel destinations. I wouldn't have shared one of these things if I didn't think that I really felt uh, they were all wonderful, okay? And it was painful for me to break it down to four. So I'll sign off by saying that if you benefited from what you've heard on this podcast, we would appreciate that big thumbs up, a share. If you have any comments or suggestions, we love that. And most importantly, subscribe. And because we ask you to subscribe, one of the reasons, well, we want to know that because you love us, but secondly, that it, when you subscribe, what it does to the algorithms and to push this broadcast out and this information out, the more that we get people to subscribe with us, the more listeners that will hear this around the world. So I do very much appreciate when anybody does subscribe. So that's it, Catherine. And all you listeners, I really appreciate you tuning in. And until next week, thanks for listening. We really hope that this episode has got you dreaming about what you could be doing with your solo travel adventures. 
You know what's going to help you make that even one little step easier is if you had an amazing packing list. Now, of course, when Astrid goes to the Holy Land, she's going to have one item. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm probably going to pay two pairs of leggings, a sweater, two types of tops. Uh, and that's so, it. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to I'm gonna be wearing the same thing every other day. <laughs> well, if you don't want to just wear the same thing every other day. Astrid has an amazing packing list that's going to help you make your packing just a tiny bit easier. You can get it at her website, astridtravel.com. Right there on the front page is an easy place you can put in your email and download that packing list right away. This podcast is available worldwide on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, any fine place that podcasts can be found. We look forward to hearing about your dreams for your solo travel bucket list. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week on Solo Travel Talk. Thank you for listening to Solo Travel Talk. Follow Astrid on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. To learn more about Astrid or her solo travel advisors, visit her website, astridtravel.com. <laughs>